The Nationals have presented a list of demands to the Prime Minister in exchange for their support on a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Scott Morrison wants the Nationals to back the policy before he jets off to the Glasgow Climate, climate Summit at the end of the week. Let's now bring in our politician panel and we're now joined by Liberal MP Jason Falinski and Labour MP Andrew Giles. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for speaking with Weekend Breakfast. Um, Jason Falinski, if I could start with you. Uh, this week on Thursday you said, I am more confident at the end of this week than I ever have been that we will go to Glasgow with a commitment to a net zero emissions by 2050. Even if it means paying the ransom that the National Party has given to the Liberal Party? Fazio, I have to keep in mind that you're one of the few people who read and listen to me, and uh, that's what I'd always... Um, next time I start saying stuff, I must remember, if I'm on with Fazio this weekend, I'd, I'd be more careful. Um, but, look, I wouldn't describe it as a... You and my mother, Fazio, you're the two, so thank you. We watch. Um, we watch closely. Uh, I wouldn't describe it as a ransom. I mean, let, let's, let's um, put this in context. Um, there are net zero is going to have enormous benefits for Australia. We are in a very privileged position compared to a lot of other nations around the world. The National Party and a lot of rural and regional liberals as well represent communities that will be or could possibly be adversely affected by this transition. That's not new. Um, you know, when we, uh, uh, in the 1980s, when the Hawke and Keating government were reforming uh, textile, clothing and footwear, there were, lo there were people who didn't do well out of that and we had structural adjustment packages. Mm. What the Nationals are looking at, what rural and regional Liberals are looking at, is how we can make sure that we do this transition on just terms so that no one gets left behind, that the benefits that we as a country will... Um, will uh, have from this process are shared by everyone and not just accumulated by a few people in major metro metro areas. Mm -hmm. That's a really important discussion to have. That's a really important, if dare I say it, argument to have before we make commitments. So I'm interested in, I know everyone else in Parliament is interested in making sure that in this process no one gets left behind and that's what we that's the discussion that we're going through at the moment. Andrew Giles, the focus has been on the government this week and um, the coalition finding an agreement on this net zero target by 2050. I understand that Labor is not in government, that you are the opposition, but the role of the opposition is to present an alternative. So why is Labor waiting till after this Glasgow summit to, um, to lay out their plan for a net zero target? Well, that's not quite right, Joanne. Uh, Joanna. We've, we, in the Parliament this week, we put forward a proposal to legislate net zero by 2050. Mm. Uh, in the past year, we've put forward a range of really important proposals that would allow us to seize the opportunity of becoming a renewable energy superpower, um, from rewiring the nation to our commitments on electric vehicles. Whereas what we've seen from the government is eight years of inaction and an extraordinary cost. Australians are already being left behind. We see that now. The Prime Minister has never shown leadership on this issue. And now, while I've been anxious about the prospect of Barnaby Joyce being acting Prime Minister at the end of the week, it's clear he's already in the reins now. We are seeing this ridiculous farce where the National Party are openly brawling with their Liberal colleagues, making threats instead of being part of a serious discussion about a transition to net zero, a transition that secures jobs and gives every Australian the opportunity, the unique opportunities we have to become that renewable energy superpower. It's incredibly frustrating for any Australian to watch this farce that's playing out, this rabble without a cause that are pretending to be a government when the stakes are so high. On that note, Jason Falinski, Barnaby Joyce was asked yesterday in an interview if there were any non-negotiables in this list that was presented to the government. He said that there were very strong requests that are held dearly by the room. Bridget McKenzie, also in the Nationals, has said that things could get ugly if the Liberals go ahead without the National support on a net zero target. Are, the co are your coalition, party, um, coalition partners leading you here? Are they taking advantage of the situation? Are the Liberals being led by the Nationals on this issue? Well, um, perish the thought that there are politicians in Parliament who try to take advantage of situations to maximise outcomes from their electorates. Um, but look, there is no doubt that there is a lot of very um, difficult negotiations going on at the moment. Um, I mean, Joe, Fazzy, you know where I stand on this. 
I'm making um, as strong an argument on the other side um, to make sure that we get to a commitment of net zero by 2050 and that the Prime Minister is able to go to Glasgow with that commitment, put get Australia at the table so that we can um, be part of the discussion, part of the narrative towards transitioning um, the world globally to net zero by 2050, not just for us, but for the future of the planet, our children, etc. So in that context, it's disappointing that this conference won't have people like the President of China, like the Prime Minister of India, who are very large um, emitters of carbon or greenhouse gases. But we are going to play our part, and, and that's the sort of discussions I'm having. And sure, there are people on the other side who are standing up for their communities in this process, and, you know, that's how, that's how democracy works. Uh, Andrew Giles, you know, it's all well and good to call the coalition a rabble without a cause but again we ask where is Labour's plan when it comes to reaching the 2030 targets or the 2050 targets you know it you know Labour seems to support a 2050 zero emissions target but no details on actually how to get there we saw shadow climate change uh, minister Chris Bowen and Q&A saying that Australia needs more medium term targets for 2030 and yet still no concrete plans where are the plans? How are you speaking to the regional electorates in particular who are very concerned about where their jobs, their lifestyles are going to be in this transition phase? Well, on that point, one thing that is frustrating is the lost opportunities. We could have had thousands of jobs in renewables projects if we'd had the policy certainty that Australia needed over the last eight years instead of eight years of denial, deflection and distraction and scare campaign after scare campaign, many of them led by the current Prime Minister. Now, in terms of our approach, we have started to set out a clear framework of our climate and energy policies under Chris Bowen. We've also been very clear that we need more ambition in terms of medium term targets, but it's not going to be, unfortunately, to the cost of every Australian Anthony Albanese that's going to Glasgow next week. It's Scott Morrison. So that's down to him. After that, of course, you will see from Labor, well before the next election, an approach including medium-term targets that gets us to the goal that we need to get to, that the world is asking us to get to. And we've seen, again, criticism from our closest allies um, just in the media today about the intransigence of our government and the risks that it is, it is imposing on all Australians. Jason Felinski, will Australians pay the price for that policy uncertainty in this country, and particularly those in the regions who could potentially benefit from the opportunities that this transition brings? Uh, Joe, I think that's right. I think if that we don't um, commit to a net zero um, target by 2050, what we, you know, uh, there is a, there is a cost to that, and but what I think embedded in your question is absolutely right that there is, we leave behind enormous benefits. So it's, it's, it's not just in renewable energy, it's in clean hydrogen, it's in um, rare earths, it's in nickel, it's in copper, it's, dare I say it, for a large part of the world, they will have to transition to uranium as, as their ba base load power source. Um, and we, we, are, we have, have the largest deposits of uranium in the world. And then from that comes a whole bunch of um, manufacturing jobs in, uh, that have embedded energy as their major input. So if we can get to a point where we have some of the cleanest, cheapest energy in the world, you will see massive amounts of job creation in the manufacturing sector. So for where we stand at the moment is on the precipice of a fantastic future um, economically, ju not just for, for metropolitan areas, but for rural and regional areas. So we need to seize that opportunity. Now, that's the argument I'm making. Um, that's the argument many others are making. Um, and that, I think, is the right approach that we should take to Glasgow. You might be making that argument, but it, is the government properly articulating that argument or is it being clouded by the rhetoric from the nationals? Mm. Well, you know, in all these discussions that we're having, um, it, it's a debate, and debates are, to use your word, cloudy. Um, there are uh, other sides, but you need to have a debate before you can come to a decision. And where we stand at the moment is that we are um, having that debate so we can get the clarity of a decision. I am, um, as, as Fazia pointed out, I'm reasonably confident uh, that we will go to Glasgow with a vision, with a commitment, and in that um, will be a whole bunch of opportunities for Australians, um, regardless of where they live, that we will be able to take advantage 
of and we need and then the next issue for any government regardless of who it is will be to reach out and seize those opportunities. Andrew Giles on the topic of vision is Labor reluctant to declare ambitious plans and ambitious targets both long term and medium term as well given that at the last federal election Labor's climate policy was ambitious and Labor lost the election. Well, I mean, we saw in the last uh, election campaign a shocking scare campaign by the Prime Minister. And what, what's really shocking is how dishonest it's been revealed to be, because all the things he complained about, electric vehicles ruining the weekend, uh, as just one example, are now things he's holding out to be important parts of his policy agenda. Uh, so you can imagine the frustration I feel about the wasted opportunities. I agree with so much of what Jason said about the opportunity that Australia has and Australian jobs have. But all of those things have been trashed by the last eight years of policy uncertainty and climate denial. And we're still no closer to any answers. I mean, the government's approaching this like it's some sort of uh, year nine group assignment um, to be handed in the last minute rather than an incredibly serious policy challenge that affects the whole world as well as Australian jobs and Australian lives into the future. Uh, Anthony Albanese has been clear that everything we do is grounded in our sense of the national interest. That's been our consistent position when it comes to climate and making sure that Australians understand that we are excited about the unique opportunities Australia has to become a renewable energy superpower with all that brings, the economic advantages at home and abroad. But what we need is a real debate over climate, not the nonsense that we've seen playing out over the last eight years, and in particular in recent days with cabinet ministers talking about this being ugly if they don't get what they want. That's the opposite of how this should be approached. It's the opposite of what Australia needs. It's the opposite of what the world needs right now. Um, just before we let you both go, we are curious, and so I'm sure the viewers are curious, Andrew Giles, why are you wearing a scarf inside? <laughs> yeah, well, I make it to oh, okay, my, my friends brilliant. and family in Melbourne. Who are, it's a bit cold down there as people are enjoying um, their freedoms. It was knitted for me by some lovely women, Rachel and Angela, who are mm. part of a group called Common Grace, who knitted these scarves to remind every member of parliament about the urgency of action on climate change. Mm. So thank you, uh, Rachel and Angela. Thank you, all the members of, of Common Grace. I won't forget your call for me to take so seriously this great challenge. OK, it's a lovely scarf. Andrew Giles and Jason yes. Falinski, thank you both for joining us this morning. Thanks so much.